Hello and welcome to the event. This short video will give you a little bit of background to Newington Green Meeting House. With funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, New Unity has transformed its Newington Green Meeting House into a fully accessible, free heritage space, showing its radical history and encouraging visitors to think differently. The building, which was a hotbed of revolutionary thinking in the 18th century, holds stories of Richard Price, Anna Letitia Barbold, Andrew Pritchard, and most notably, Mary Wollstonecraft leading to it being described as the birthplace of British feminism. The Meeting House hosts a regular programme of events and exhibitions, celebrating this history and serving its local community. Find out more online. Welcome to everybody um, for this third Mary Wollstonecraft birthday celebration presented by the Mary Wollstonecraft Fellowship. The Mary Wollstonecraft Fellowship is a literary society dedicated to appreciation of the writings of Wollstonecraft and to study of her life, times and circle. We were launched on, in 2019 at the first celebration, and you can find us online. Um, I'm just going to actually put the web page in the chat. And um, I just want to say a little bit about how the, how the event will unfold. Um, it's in three parts. Um, first, because we can't welcome you to the physical spaces of Newington Green, and the meeting house is planned. We've got a short virtual tour conducted by Roberta Wedge. Um, second, at 6 p.m., we've got our main feature. Dr. Barbara, uh, Professor Barbara Taylor will talk on Mary Wollstonecraft and radical dissent, telling us about the ideas that filled the spaces at Newington Green, uh, where Wollstonecraft established a school in 1784. And as Amy said, there'll be a chance to ask questions. Third, at 7 p.m., we'll be holding the Zoom room open for an extra 30 minutes for anyone who'd like to learn more about the Mary Wollstonecraft Fellowship or ask Roberta informally a little bit more about Newington Green and the current activities of the Meeting House. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the world premiere of a virtual tour of Newington Green with Roberta Wedge. Uh, anyone who was at the 2019 celebration and many of you who have visited the Meeting House already will know that Roberta is an inspirational advocate for Wollstonecraft and her ideas. She's run a blog, A Vindication of the Rights of Mary, formed part of the campaign Mary on the Green, and is a tour guide extraordinaire for all sorts of locations connected with Wollstonecraft, but above all, Newington Green. Well, Roberta, thank you so much for agreeing to give us this tour of um, Newington Green and the Meeting House. Um, I see you've got your suffragette liberty cap on and um, your Unitarian badge. So you're going to tell us a little bit about um, the community that was here when Mary Wollstonecraft came to Newington Green to set up a school in 1784 when she was around 25. She came with her friend Fanny Blood and her two sisters Eliza and Everina to set up a school for girls. So I wanted to ask you, what was the Green like then? And what kind of community was she entering? Claire Tomlin, in her biography, memorably says, it was far enough from the city to offer the pleasures of the country without being comatose. Can you tell us a little bit more about the place? Right, well, it's a great pleasure to invite you here and to, to introduce you to, not introduce, reintroduce you to Newington Green and to introduce you to the refurbished um, chapel which we're going to get into the meeting house itself. Um, the Newington Green that Mary Wollstonecraft found in the 1780s in some regards was identical to what it is today. The green itself is the same shape and size as it has been for hundreds of years. The roads are, are the same layout, the green lanes coming down um, from the north down to Smithfield, the Drover's Road, um, church walk, the passage next to the, the chapel, all the same. But so much is different as well. Um, all around the green now you see shops and restaurants and eateries and places to meet and convivial places and the, it, it wasn't like that in her day. Um, it was houses, merchants houses, because the city uh, a few miles away was crucially on the Roman road, the straight road, now the A10, 
um, leading right down into the heart of the city. So it was a great place for the merchants to have their, their family homes, the clean air. And so there's always been a, a strong community of um, uh, merchants, traders, bankers, um, with ties to the city, not to the royal court. Um, and they were the dissenters who gathered here around the green for hundreds of years. And that's the community that she came into. They had, um, had built this, this meeting house some generations before, um, and they were comfortable, they're confident, prosperous, uh, but still slightly outside the mainstream. Um, so that's the community she found. And uh, can you tell us about the leading light of the Newington Green community when, when Wollstonecraft was here? At that point, the leading light was Reverend Dr. Richard Price, the minister of this chapel. Um, he was a, a great thinker, uh, a mathematician, actually, for, to start with, but also a, a pioneer of liberty. And he spoke um, so eloquently about the, the principles that he believed in that he drew in um, uh, pioneers from all over and he had a great influence on the American Revolution as we know so people like Benjamin Franklin, John and Abigail Adams, second president of the United States um, all came to hear him speak either here in the meeting house or in his house which was just uh, across the green um, and that's the one building which remains as part of the green uh, aside from the meeting house is Richard Price's house that oldest brick Terrace in London, of course, when it was built in 1659, it wasn't in London, um, but it remains to this day, um, giving us a context for the history of Newington. Now, what do we know about Mary Wollstonecraft School? It was her experience in teaching that led to the start of her writing career um, and kick-started her feminism, wasn't it? Crucially, she came here under the auspices of Mrs. Berg, and Mrs. Berg was the prosperous widow of Dr. Berg, friend of Dr. Price, and the Bergs had run a dissenting academy um, for boys and young men um, for decades, and, and Berg had, had written thoughts on education. So um, when Wollstonecraft was told by her friends that she had a book in her, she was eventually persuaded to write thoughts on the education of daughters, and that was her first, her first book, her first entry into publishing. It was uh, one of her friends at Newington Green, uh, Hewlett by name, who introduced her down in the city to the publisher, uh, Joseph Johnson, um, and he uh, was the centre of a, a great concatenation of writers and thinkers, Tom Paine. Uh, again, the links between Newington Green and, and the, the city, um, and, the, and then to the, the United States, what became the United States, are, are rich and, and uh, deeply developed. Um, we'd like to say that in Newington Green, uh, we, we had the first, we created the first draft of the Constitution of the United States. There's a bit of poetic license, but the idea is that the, um, the, the thoughts which became the United States were first discussed here in this meeting house and in the, the, the circle around uh, Richard Price. But you were asking about the school, and the school was uh, set up by, by Wollstonecraft, as you said, with her, um, her best friend and, and her sisters, because um, Mrs. Berg gave her the opportunity, had been looking for such a... Um, open-minded, creative, innovative, young female school teacher to kind of counterbalance um, the work that she had spent in her life supporting her husband with the, the young men's education. So she, uh, she helped Wollstonecraft um, acquire a house here, and that's where they, they ran the school, and Wollstonecraft could experiment with, with her educational ideas. And we don't know for certain where the school was, but there's reason to believe that it was on the northeast corner of the square, and that of course is where the school is today, Newington Green Primary School. And that's where the, uh, the plaque, the green plaque, uh, erected by Islington Council, is on the, the, the tall building um, belonging to today's um, state school. Um, of course, when we cross over from the, the park of the green itself, um, to the meeting house, we're crossing the ancient border between Islington and Hackney. And um, so we're now in the um, sister borough uh, of Hackney. 
So what was Mary Wollstonecraft's association with the Meeting House? Did she actually come here? Did she worship here? She did come here. She was uh, baptised into the Church of England, um, as was expected back in the day. She was born in Spitalfield in, in London, of course. And she never um, renounced the Church of England. She was eventually uh, married in the Church of England at St Pancras, and then tragically, six months later, buried there as well. Um, and then she was reburied later in um, the Church of England down in Bournemouth. Um, she never uh, disavowed the, the, the church, the Church of England, but she was open-minded. Um, she was a free thinker, not in the sense of, uh, it's become a bit of a euphemism now for atheists, particularly for our American cousins, but she was literally a free thinker. She would think freely and she would go and listen to people and, and, and when she was in Newington Green, she did come here to worship. She, um, there was a particular family that sat in a particular pew and we know that Wollstonecraft sat next to their pew, therefore logically, uh, since we know where that family sat, she must have been in the next one over and that is pew is now numbered 19 and that's where I have sat to welcome um, visitors of a Sunday. Now, thanks to the fabulous um, Heritage Lottery um, refurbishment, we've got um, the building open um, much more often during the week, so visitors are very welcome at other times. Um, but on, on the, uh, the subject of religion, um, Wollstonecraft also worshipped at the, um, the other Anglican church, up, up Church Walk beside the chapel. You can walk for a mile, be in Stoke Newington, and there's a little church of St. Mary there. Um, and crucially, I think, to put it in context, it's worth remembering that Dr. Richard Price's wife, Sarah, was an Anglican. She never um, disavowed the religion of her birth. She never came to this dissenting chapel of a Sunday. The, the congregation could respect their minister without expecting him to enforce theological obedience in his wife. Uh, the dissenters respected freedom of conscience, they respected women in general, and I think it's really refreshing to consider people flocking from all over to listen to Richard Price and not diminishing his stature in one whit by the fact that his wife had different opinions than him. Good for all of them, I say. You've anticipated the next question, in a way, which was... Um, this description of Newington Green Chapel as the birthplace of feminism um, within the current project, this refurbishment project, this regeneration project, which is, is going on at Newington Green. Why the birthplace of feminism? Can we really say that? We can say that, and we did say that. And um, it's the birthplace of feminism in the sense that it is a tangible, open, physical place where visitors are welcome to come and soak in the atmosphere that made Mary Wollstonecraft what she was. I like to say that Newington Green radicalized Mary Wollstonecraft because that's a, a, a contentious word which deserves unpicking. But it is here in this building and in the village where she heard the ideas that helped make her who she was. She arrived here at 25, she'd had a rough childhood and so on as as most people um, listening to this will already know. But lots of people have a bad childhood. The world is unfair. Everybody knows the world is unfair. But the ideas that she encountered here directly from Richard Price and through the other people um, in, in his circle helped her to understand that it's not divinely ordained injustice. These are um, injustices which are created by people and therefore can be undone by people. We can create a political and a social system that um, doesn't have to live with these unfairnesses. And it was that moment uh, of time, only a couple of years that she spent here, that changed her from just well, she was never one to just accept everything. Obviously, she fought against injustices in her life, but this gave the additional impetus to say it's not necessarily this way. If, if it's a human problem, then humans can solve it. Um, so that's, that's how she got her political um, 
uh, turn from uh, to to have the sense that these problems can be actively dealt with by a community of people. And as for the the birthplace of feminism, again, it's somewhere that visitors can come because there's nowhere else. There's no other building that Wollstonecraft lived and worked in which is still standing. It's enormously frustrating. She lived in so many different places. There are at least four plaques to her in London, uh, uh, London alone, and every one of them says, in a building on this site or near this site, because the buildings don't still stand. Um, so if you want to breathe the essence of Mary Wollstonecraft, this is the place to come to. How is Mary Wollstonecraft's legacy a focus for the Meeting House at Newington Green today? What will, the, what will this room be used for? Well, the Mary Wollstonecraft room will be used for all sorts of events, as will the chapel itself, uh, particularly for school education events. Um, we've got wonderful opportunity with the National Lottery Heritage Fund refurbishment money, not just for the physical infrastructure of the building, but also for cultural programming. And that includes outreach to schools um, to ensure that children learn about the history of human rights and feminism and, and bringing that into the challenges of today. Uh, another thing that the room has been used for and will continue to be used for is exhibitions of various sorts. So you can see from the pictures on the wall now um, and that they're, they're talking about different issues of, of our day now. Uh, we also have the beautiful print by Stewie. Um, he was an artist, a street artist, who created a life-sized image of Mary Wollstonecraft, which miraculously manifested on the outside of the chapel about 10 years ago, and really kick-started some of the public interest in Wollstonecraft and also the work that the chapel was doing. Um, you also see uh, the bronze bust uh, by Jenny Littlewood, which is in the Mary Wollstonecraft room, which is of, of Wollstonecraft, obviously. And that... Um, leads us to the connection with the green itself where Maggie Hamling's a sculpture for Mary Wollstonecraft appeared um, last November um, and that's drawn huge attention nationally and internationally as you know and the more attention to Newington Green and to Wollstonecraft the more attention will be to the meeting house here and to her legacy going into the future. Yeah, I think we'll have a, a brief five minute pause um, before we move on to the next section of the evening. Um, I just wanted to say special thanks, well, obviously to Roberta, uh, but also to Stephen, Morris, um, uh, Stephen Morrison, who's the technical manager at uh, Newington Green Meeting House for making that film possible. So take a little break if you'd like and come back at six. <laughs> Okay, Emma, I think that's everyone who's joining us for 6pm. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Amy. And thank you so much for this opportunity for the Mary Wollstonecraft Fellowship, this new literary society to promote appreciation of Mary Wollstonecraft's life and work, um, to give us this opportunity to invite um, Professor Barbara Taylor um, to mark Mary Wollstonecraft's birthday in style um, in this week of fantastic events that you've organized at Newington Green Meeting House. Um, Professor Barbara Taylor is at Queen Mary University of London and um, she's the author, as I'm sure most of you know, of many publications um, on the history of radicalism, on women's writing, uh, and women's history and on questions of psychology and subjectivity. Um, she brought all these strands together in her landmark book, Mary Wollstonecraft and the Feminist Imagination, uh, which was published in 2003. And there she gave a compelling account of the unique combination of reason and passion in Wollstonecraft's uh, radical vision um, of a world based on equality. She also brought to the fore the importance of religious faith as a vital part of her feminist utopianism. 
So there could be no one better than Barbara Taylor to stand virtually in the dissenting chapel at Newington Green, um, where the radical cleric, the Reverend Dr. Richard Price delivered sermons and Mary Wollstonecraft worshiped. And tell us about the ferment of ideas associated with this place, Newington Green. Um, Barbara has said that she would be happy to answer questions after her talk. Um, please don't, um, don't, don't enter any stuff on chat during the talk, but afterwards you can signal if you'd like to ask a question and then I'll, have a, I'll check who wants to and, and call on you to uh, put your question verbally. And um, I'll relay the questions on to her. I will now hand over to Professor Barbara Taylor speaking on Mary Wollstonecraft and radical dissent. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Emma. Um, uh, thank you um, to everyone involved with um, uh, the um, renewal of the Newington Green Chapel to Amy and, and Roberta and uh, many more. And um, uh, I also want to just say that um, we have in the audience um, uh, Walson Cross um, leading biographer, um, Professor Janet Todd. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have her <coughs> with us today. Um, so, um, I'm, so what I'm going to do um, as um, indicated is uh, I'm going to be talking principally about um, rational dissent um, as it was um, in Wollstonecraft's day. I'm gonna begin by taking you into some of the places that you've just seen um, on the uh, video that, um, uh, that was uh, where you managed to see the interior of the chapel. Um, I'm taking you back to um, a day in November, 1784. Outside is the pretty village green um, that uh, we still have today. Although at that point you could find uh, sheep grazing under the elm trees. Here inside the chapel, if I'm conjuring up for you, there's a congregation of soberly dressed men and women listening with great attention uh, to the man in the pulpit, which is Dr. Richard Price that Robert has mentioned. Uh, he's a vehement little figure who, as he speaks, shifts his wig back and forth across his head, twists and untwists his cocked hat, winds his legs around each other. These mannerisms don't bother most of the people in his audience who are used to them. Uh, they slightly disconcert Mary Wollstonecraft, who's here for the first time. Um, she's sitting very near, um, I mean, I think Roberta's already given you a sense of, um, of her position in the chapel. She's sitting near a boy, um, Samuel Rogers, who will grow up to become a banker and a very well-known poet. Nearby, as Roberta mentioned, is Hannah Berg, widow of James Berg, one of uh, Britain's leading uh, political writers. And over in another pew, is Anna Barbo, um, a hugely respected SAS poet and children's book writer. Um, other political and literary luminaries are dotted about. Uh, we see Wollstonecraft looking about her as one does in a strange place, but now she's attending um, to Dr. Price's sermon a little bit dutifully at first. She's a very pious woman, but sermons aren't high on her list of pleasures, but then with more excitement. She's heard that this pastor, um, an enlightened nonconformist, that is a Protestant who does not conform to the Church of England, or a rational dissenter, as he's also called, is a great radical, a positive incendiary. And now she's discovering just what this means, as Price describes Christianity as an egalitarian creed, declares his support for general human rights, praises the new Republic of America, and attacks the current British government as despotic and corrupt. His rhetoric is fierce, but optimistic. God, he says, has designed humanity for perfect happiness. Uh, the present times are a preparation for a coming age of universal enlightenment, equality, and virtue. Evoking these anticipated glories, he's got nothing to say about their benefits for poor young women. But Wollstonecraft, who's a school teacher, knows very well how to apply generalities to particular instances. And listening to Price call on his audience to join him in, a pro in promoting God's plan to create a world free from oppression and injustice, she feels her spine stiffen. Now I've made up this scene. 
that, of course, but something very much like it did happen. And now I'm going to tell you about its consequences. Eight years after she first entered this chapel, Mary Wollstonecraft published her Vindication of the Rights of Woman, the seminal text of modern Western feminism. Price himself sadly was dead by then, but she'd not forgotten him. He was the best of men, she wrote in The Rights of Woman, or indeed the lessons he had taught her. The central part played by left-wing Protestantism in Wollstonecraft's feminism, and indeed in early British feminism as a whole, has received insufficient uh, attention from historians, although I think more now than certainly when I was writing my book. But its influence was profound, and I'm going to talk in some detail about this influence in a moment. But first, I'm going to tell you more about the young woman who sat in the chapel some 200 plus years ago. For those of you who are already intimately familiar with Mary Wollstonecraft, the story that I'm about to tell you will be very familiar, but perhaps you don't mind hearing, being reminded about it again. Mary Wollstonecraft was born in Spitalfields, London on the 27th of April, 1759. And the family that she entered was modestly prosperous. Her paternal grandfather owned a successful Spitalfield silk weaving business. Her mother's father was a wine merchant in Ireland. In 1765, her paternal grandfather died and her father inherited the family business. Unlike his father, however, Edward Wollstonecraft had little taste for the commercial life, opting instead to become a gentleman farmer. In the early 1760s, he took his young family to live on a farm in Epping, which was the first of six moves in Wollstonecraft's childhood, each of which saw a marked decline in the family's financial fortunes. Edward, it seems, had no talent for farming or for much of anything else. According to his daughter, he was a childish bully given to abusing his wife and children after heavy drinking sessions. Mary, who often intervened to protect her mother from his drunken violence, later told her husband, the philosopher William Godwin, how much she had despised her father. And um, Godwin comments, Mary was not formed to be the contented and unresisting subject of a despot. And this was in his posthumous memoirs of his wife. Walsakoff's Walter mother, on the other hand, apparently submitted to her husband's behavior without protest. To her oldest daughter, at least, Elizabeth Wollstonecraft seems to have been an uncaring mother. She idolized her eldest son, Edward or Ned, to the point where, um, I'm quoting Wollstonecraft, in comparison with her affection for him, she might be said not to love the rest of her children. Ned, um, who uh, perhaps or perhaps not, it's not entirely clear, was heir to one third of his grandfather's fortune, enjoyed prospects and prestige much greater than the rest of his six siblings, including his uh, much cleverer older sister, whose acuity and forcefulness, so unconventional in a girl, certainly didn't improve her standing in the family. Such indeed is the force of prejudice. Wollstonecraft later wrote bitterly that what was called spirit and wit in him was cruelly repressed as forwardness in me. By the end of the 1770s, the Wollstonecraft family resources sunk to a very low ebb. As the Wollstonecraft children looked about them, prospects for the future must have seemed very gloomy particularly for the girls. Poverty seriously undermined a middle-class woman's opportunities in the marriage market, while remaining unwed, reduced status and life chances even further. Throughout the 18th century, employment opportunities for such women were very thin on the ground. Teaching, governessing, needlework, ladies' companion, these are some of the few jobs open to genteel women of small means. And by the late 1780s, Wollstonecraft had done and hated them all. Literary work, however, was also open to women with the confidence or the desperation to attempt it. And in 1786, while living here at Newington Green, Wollstonecraft decided to try her hand. Her first book, a sternly didactic tract on female manners titled Thoughts on the Education of Daughters earned her 10 pounds. Wollstonecraft was delighted. I hope you have not forgot I am an author, she boasted grandly to her sister Eliza a year later. 
Now, for a woman to take up her pen in this way was far more common in the 18th century than is often realized. Indeed, at least one sector of the literary marketplace, the rapidly expanding world of popular fiction, was said to be nearly monopolized by women authors. Nevertheless, as a career move, it was sufficiently unusual to require a fair degree of hubris on a woman's part, something in which Wollstonecraft was never deficient. In 1786, she was introduced to Joseph Johnson, a leading publisher of radical literature. Uh, he soon agreed to publish her thoughts on the education of daughters. And then after she was sacked from her last teaching post as governess to the Kingsbury's in Ireland to employ her to write on a regular basis for his new literary review, The Analytical Review. In 1788, Johnson published her first novel, Mary of Fiction, a book of children's stories. He also brought out a female reader compiled by her under a male pseudonym and commissioned a number of translations. Now, labors of this kind were the bread and butter of professional authorship. And at this stage, there was pretty much nothing in Wollstonecraft's career to set it apart from hack writers of her day. But in 1789, all that changed. The outbreak of the French Revolution in July of that year sent shockwaves throughout political Britain. In 1790, the liberal Whig Edmund Burke, to the disgust of his political associates, published his famous attack on French revolutionary principles, reflections on the revolution in France. Wollstonecraft, after a little encouragement from Johnson, decided to reply and rapidly produced a vindication of the rights of men which was the first in a general radical onslaught on Burke. It was well received and she began to get a reputation. Two years later, she followed it up with a vindication of the rights of woman, which brought her much greater fame. Her name was bracketed with Tom Paine's, whose own rights of man appeared in 1791. She was commended in France and America and fated by fellow radicals in England. Even political conservatives grudgingly took notice of her as an impressive champion of her sex. A vindication of the rights of woman is often described as ahead of its time, and certainly many of its arguments have a contemporary ring. But Wollstonecraft's book is very much a work of its age, imbued with the 18th century spirit of enlightened innovation. The political principles espoused there are usually classified as liberal reformist, or at least they certainly were in the past um, when I was doing my research. But this is to understate Wollstonecraft's radicalism. A dedicated revolutionary, unlike most British radicals, she never repudiated the French Revolution, although she mourned its descent into Jacobin terrorism. Wollstonecraft was passionately committed to a complete social transformation along democratic egalitarian lines. And I'm quoting now. A spirit is abroad to break the chains that had hitherto eaten into the human soul, she declared in 1792. Reason has at last shown her captivating face, beaming with benevolence, and it will be impossible for the dark hand of despotism again to obscure its radiance. Applied to women, this vision translated into an ideal of absolute sexual equality, a wild wish, as Wollstonecraft wrote in The Rights of Woman, for a world free from sexual distinctions. The ambition, as I've said, seems up to date, and indeed Wollstonecraft has much to say about defamatory gender stereotypes, sexual exploitation, the inequitable treatment of women in marriage, employment, culture, and political life that still, sadly, resonates today. A sharp critic of femininity, her description of how bouncy, assertive young girls pushed into the sexual marketplace become simpering, self-humiliating coquettes can still make a modern reader wince. But her leading concern is with women's moral degradation the corrosive effects of oppression on female religious sensibility and ethical agency. Her language is stern, peremptory, and her stance toward women severely prescriptive. Treated as inferior, women have become 
inferior, she insists. And it's only a complete revolution of morals and manners that will restore their natural virtue. Quoting her now, rendered weak and wretched by oppression, she writes, women must learn to abandon slavish dependence for a life of moral dignity. And a longer quote, for if they really be capable of acting like rational creatures, let them not be treated like slaves or like the brutes who are dependent on the reason of man when they associate with him, but cultivate their minds, give them the salutary sublime curb of principle and let them attain conscious dignity by feeling themselves only dependent on God. Women, she exhorts, must forgo frivolity and childish irresponsibility for righteous rationality. In line with this high-mindedness, the rights of woman adopts a strict line on sexual matters, denouncing physical desire as depraved. Present day readers find this disconcerting, but Wollstonecraft was almost certainly a virgin when she wrote the book. Later works, especially a final novel, The Wrongs of Woman or Mariah, 1798, published posthumously, was much more libertarian. But Wollstonecraft was never a free love advocate in a modern sense. Rather, she brought to intimate life the same intensity of transformative purpose as she did to politics. Although here, utopia was to prove exceptionally elusive. In emotional relationships, Wollstonecraft seems always to have been deeply insecure and as a result, very demanding. Her first passion in her early 20s was for a young female friend, Fanny Blood, who died attended by Wollstonecraft in childbirth. Romantic friendships between women with no implication of a sexual bond were common in Wollstonecraft's day. Nonetheless, the fervency of Wollstonecraft's feelings for Fanny, so powerful according to Godwin, as for years to have constituted the ruling passion of her mind, at least raises the possibility of homosexual attachment. Nor was her next passion any more conventional, was just for the painter, Henri Fuseli, a married bisexual with whom she had a torrid, but apparently, or we think, unconsummated romance between 1789 and 1792. The affair ended miserably with Wollstonecraft rejected and humiliated. But a trip to France that she and Fuseli had planned still appealed. So at the end of 1792, she traveled to Paris alone to nurse her wounds and to witness the revolution at first hand. Paris on the brink of the terror was very frightening. And Wollstonecraft, despite immediately plunging into political activity, was nervous and lonely. But in the spring of 1793, she met Gilbert Imlay, an American army captain and commercial adventurer. He introduced her to sex, fathered her first daughter, Fanny, and after two years of increasingly panic-stricken clinging on Wollstonecraft's part and growing waywardness on his, on his left her, precipitating two suicide attempts. After the first of these attempts, Emily persuaded her to take a business trip on his behalf to Scandinavia, an extraordinary undertaking that resulted in another book, probably Wollstonecraft's literary best, A Short Residence in Sweden, published in 1795. But on returning to London where Emily was now living, Wollstonecraft found him ensconced with a new mistress and again attempted to take her life. I shall make no comments on your conduct or any appeal to the world, she wrote to him just before throwing herself into the Thames. Let my wrong sleep with me, soon shall I be at peace. Well, rescued and gradually restored to life, Wollstonecraft's energies gradually revised. And spring of 1796, she took tea with William Godwin, who by then was Britain's foremost radical philosopher. They'd met several times before and they had not got along. <laughs> but this time things went very much better. Soon they were lovers and by the winter, Wollstonecraft was pregnant. They married. And on the 30th of August, 1797, Wollstonecraft's second daughter, the future Mary Shelley, was born. The birth itself was straightforward, but the placenta failed to deliver it spontaneously and was extracted manually. Um, in fact, had um, Godwin stuck to Wollstonecraft's instructions and kept 
the midwife in charge, she probably would have survived. Anyway, um, this manual extraction led to hemorrhaging and infection. Walsercraft died 10 days later. I have not the least expectation I can ever know happiness again, Godwin wrote to a friend. Out of respect for her piety and despite his own aversion to religious ceremonies, he gave her a Christian funeral. She was buried, as Roberta has said, in St. Pancras Churchyard on the 15th of September. And in 1851, her remains in Godwin's were moved to St. Peter's Churchyard in Burnley. Wollstonecraft died a celebrity, the best known female political writer of her day. Less than five months after her death, however, fame turned to notoriety when Godwin published his memoirs of her, where amidst panegyrics to his wife, courage and creativity, he revealed in detail her sexual history and her suicide attempts. A fog of censure descended on her reputation that was not to disperse for almost a century. In a nation at war and gripped by fear of revolution, she immediately became a symbol of radical depravity, a revolutionary wanton, a Jacobinical whore. Right-wingers bewailed her floating of Christian values. A woman who has broken through all religious restraints, the Reverend Richard Paulwheel sneered in a popular anti wollstonecraft squib entitled The Unsexed Females, will commonly be found right for every species of licentious indecorum. So noxious did her reputation become that reading the rights of woman a half century later, George Eliot was astonished by its moralism and piety. Was this really, she wondered, the woman notorious for licentious godlessness? Well, like Eliot, I too, reading The Rights of Woman for the first time, was startled to discover the intensity of Wollstonecraft's religious faith. Unlike Eliot, however, I was more dismayed than cheered by it. Like most women's liberationists of the 1970s, I'd imagine Wollstonecraft as a woman sort of in my own mold, modern, secular, free from old fashioned superstitions. Uh, soon my copy was covered with scribbled marginalia. On God, more on God, God again, and very fed up by now. Oh, God, more God. I tried to ignore these for a long time. When I began to pay attention to them, my research sprang to life. I began to see how far from detracting from her politics, it was religion that drove Wollstonecraft feminism. In treating of the rights, oh, sorry, in treating of the manners of women, the rights of woman instructs. Let us trace what we should endeavor to make them in order to cooperate with the supreme being, which is, Wollstonecraft goes on to show, to make them into full and equal citizens, free from male domination and sex-based discrimination. Moreover, a closer look at the feminist tradition before and after Wollstonecraft showed me that this sort of religiously inspired sexual egalitarianism was by no means confined to her. And now I'm quoting from Mary Astell. Whatever reasons men may have for despising women and keeping them in ignorance and slavery, it can't be from their having learnt to do so in Holy Scripture, the high Anglican feminist Astell claimed at the end of the 17th century, adding stoutly, the Bible is for and not against us. Tory churchwomen like Astell prepared to, chal prepared to challenge male ascendancy were very thin on the ground but 17th and 18th century Puritan sex harbored many such godly feminists. I chose to obey God rather than man, one female Methodist preacher wrote in the 1730s on abandoning her husband to serve her maker, a variety of religious obedience whose appeal to insubordinate female spirits can readily be imagined. Among liberal Christians, the spread of enlightenment ideals gave a strong fillip to pro-women opinion, especially in the growing middle class where women themselves were acquiring a stronger voice in both spiritual and secular matters. Throughout the 18th century, women participated in theological controversies, demanded improvement in female education, and wrote innumerable defenses of women's moral entitlements. As a child of a non-observant Church of England family, the young Wollstonecraft would have been exposed to little of this. As an adolescent, she was a religious enthusiast, but of an orthodox kind. 
She attended church fairly regularly and was still doing so when she arrived here at Newington Green in 1784, at which point, as I indicated, her credo moved sharply leftward. The shift was documented in her 1788 novel, Mary of Fiction, which depicted a sensitive, high-minded girl abandoning priestly dogma in favor of what Wollstonecraft described as rational religious impulses. Reading modern theology and listening to a variety of religious viewpoints, the fictive Mary learns to think for herself. The result is a highly personal faith strongly resembling at many points the beliefs that Wollstonecraft encountered when she began attending this chapel. Uh, Wollstonecraft, as Roberta said, came to Newington Green with her sisters, Everina and Eliza, to run um, a girls' uh, school um, uh, there. I mean, um, Roberta's indicated where possibly it was. Such schools were notoriously trouble-ridden and short-lived, and this one was no exception, closing in 1786. But life on the green, with Price and his heavenly-minded friends, as one admirer dubbed the dissenting community here, was really good nonetheless. Wollstonecraft never became a rational dissenter. The low emotional temperature of the creed ultimately didn't appeal to her. And by the end of her life, she had moved even further left theologically into romanticized natural religion. But she found the company here wonderfully congenial. There were weekly supper clubs, lots of intelligent, sympathetic neighbors, and the stimulation of Price's sermons with their sophisticated philosophical arguments and sharp political polemic. But above all, there was the rational dissenting attitude to women, which while less radical than Wollstonecraft's own, was far more egalitarian than mainstream British opinion. All across Britain, small coteries of rational dissenters were creating environments exceptionally hospitable to women, especially to women intellectuals like Wollstonecraft and her friend and fellow feminist Mary Hayes. Hayes, unlike Wollstonecraft, a committed rational dissenter, was an SAS novelist and religious writer who, unable to preach in her own right, this would have been a heterodoxy too far even for rational dissenters, penned sermons for her friend John Disney, a leading minister. Dissenting educationalists and journalists praised Hayes's writings as they did Wollstonecraft's, arguing that they afforded clear proof that women were no less capable of instructing than men and that mind is of no sex. So why was rational dissent so female friendly? In the two centuries plus since Wollstonecraft had sat in the chapel, Unitarianism as it became known in the 19th century has undergone many mutations. And I'm going to draw a very general picture now as it was in her day. 18th century rational dissent was a variety of Protestant nonconformity, usually Presbyterian in origin, forged by and for the avant-garde educated middle class. The most cerebral of all the nonconformist sects, it offers its adherents a bracing brew of Lockean psychology, Newtonian cosmology, rationalist morality, and reform politics. The doctrine of the Trinity was rejected, as were Christ's claims to be God's son, and the deity was portrayed not as an awesome Jehovah, but as a benignly paternal figure, with a warm regard for all his creatures and no taste for hellfire. Calvinism, with its savagely anti-humanist ethos, was repudiated in favor of a vision of mankind as essentially good and inherently perfectible. We must get rid, I'm quoting, we must get entirely clear of all the notions of original sin to leave room for the expansion of the human heart, as Wollstonecraft wrote in, 1780, in 1794. In common with all 18th century nonconformists, rational dissenters are subject to the test acts. These are discriminatory laws that barred them from holding office under the crown or in municipal corporations, and also from taking degrees at Oxford and Cambridge. The struggle to repeal the acts, which lasted many decades, what it says at height when Wollstonecraft was attending Price's chapel, and the political stridency with which it infused the Unitarians' rhetoric clearly struck a chord in their young fellow traveler. 
The analogy between the oppression of women and the penalties suffered by dissenters was readily drawn, and Wollstonecraft herself drew it in the rights of woman. But more important for her feminism was Unitarian's, Unitarianism's emphasis on private reasoned judgment as the foundation of true religion, a principle to which the circumstances of both dissenters and women gave real political bite. I look into my own mind, Wollstonecraft wrote in 1790 in her vindication of the rights of men. My heart is human, beats quick with human sympathies, and I fear God. I fear that sublime power whose motive cre for creating me must have been wise and good. And I submit to the moral laws which my reason deduces from this view of my dependence on him. It is not his power that I fear. It is not to an arbitrary will, but to unerring reason, I submit. To act according to the dictates of reason, she wrote further on, is to conform to the law of God. This appeal to the inner authority of the individual believer was at the heart of all varieties of enlightened religion. Look for God within thyself was the motive of the age or as Wollstonecraft put it in the rights of woman, the conduct of an accountable being must be regulated by the operations of its own reason or on what foundation rests the throne of God. Liberty is the mother of virtue. Only those free to act and think for themselves will take their place by God's throne. Traditionalists may have expected women to defer to men in spiritual matters, as Eve warbles to Adam in Milton's Paradise Lost, God is thy law, thou mine, to know no more is woman's happiest knowledge and her praise. But against this, Wollstonecraft evoked the Protestant imperative for direct dealing with one's maker. If no priest may stand between the creature and his or her creator, why should a mere man stand between a woman and her God? And I'm quoting now. For if it be allowed that women were destined by providence to acquire human virtues and by the exercise of their understandings, that stability of character, which is the finest ground to rest our future hopes upon, they must be permitted to turn to the foundation of light and not be forced to shape their course by the twinkling of a mere satellite. Only a soul perfected by the exercise of its own reason, she writes, is stamped with the heavenly image. But women are being denied this exercise of free moral agency. The result is ethically devastating, not just for themselves, but also for their families and children. And I'm quoting, for how can a woman be a good wife or mother unless freedom strengthens her reason till she comprehends her duties? For unless they comprehend it, Unless their morals be fixed on the same immutable principle as those of man, no authority can make them discharge it in a virtuous manner. They may be convenient slaves, but slavery will have its constant effect, degrading the master and the abject dependent. That's the end of the quote. Only a free, self-determining woman, kowtowing to no one, including her husband, would properly fulfill her family responsibilities. Challenges to men's power in the family were rare in the 18th century. Even the most enlightened opinion makers defended patriarchal prerogatives and rational dissenters were no exception. Believing that while wives should be treated with affection and respect, final authority in the home rested with men. Wollstonecraft's refusal of this position her critique of male conjugal rule as a tyranny on par with old regime despotism was too extreme a position for most Unitarians. Yet it was rational dissent that gave her a vital intellectual weapon in this contest against patriarchy in its anti-authoritarian interpretation of mankind's duty to God. And this is a slightly complicated and very important point. Rational dissenting theology held that the power of God was limited by his goodness, and that it was this goodness rather than his power to which his human children owed obeisance. Or as Richard Price put it in his um, very important book, The Review of Morals, 
God's sovereign authority derived not from his almighty power, but from the infinite excellencies of his nature as the foundation of reason and wisdom. In other words, we worship God not because we fear his power, but because we admire and love his goodness. For to power alone, whether mortal, divine or mortal, nothing is owed. But if it's not power, but goodness that elicits respect in the divine sphere, why should this not be true in family life as well? And here's what I think is a really crucial quote. It were to be wished, Wollstonecraft writes, that women would cherish an affection for their husbands founded on the same principle that devotion to God ought to rest upon, which sounds shockingly retro retrograde until you realize exactly what she's saying. Husbands should be loved in as much and only in as much as they possess virtues capable of inspiring wifely respect. And I'm quoting now, no other firm base is there under heaven for let women beware of the fallacious light of sentiment too often used as a softer phrase for sensuality. Phrase for sensuality. It is neither power nor romantic enthusiasm which should tie women to their menfolk, but only shared love of the good. The full implications of this argument were only to become evident in Wollstonecraft's final work, her novel titled The Wrongs of Woman and Mariah, where she denounced marriage as legal prostitution and defended women's right to leave vicious husbands, leave independently with their children, and even under certain conditions, engage in extramarital sexual liaisons. This was a brand of pro-women thinking well beyond anything enlightened dissenters were prepared to endorse. And it was to be nearly two centuries before Christian feminists began to give public support to such ideas, or indeed any feminists at all. What they thought privately, of course, was another matter. And it's interesting to speculate how many women or men belonging to chapels like these nodded quietly to themselves when they read Wollstonecraft's fierce polemics against patriarchal marriage. Or how many more Unitarian ministers there might have been, like the one in Newcastle, who, writing to his daughter on her marriage in 1812, urged her to, and I'm quoting, peruse the strong and often coarse, though too often well-founded strictures of Mary Wollstonecraft. In Wollstonecraft's day, only a minority of rational dissenters explicitly identified themselves as women's rights advocates, and some very influential one, notably Anna Barbo, who is commemorated on a plaque in the chapel, publicly opposed her ideas. Yet at a time when most Britons believed in Eve's divinely prescribed inferiority to Adam, rational dissent offered a real beacon of hope to sexual egalitarians. And it's no accident that when organized feminism began to appear in Britain during the 1850s, it was Unitarianism that provided many of its intellectual leaders. Looking back then to the moment that I evoked at the beginning of this talk, when the young Wollstonecraft first set foot in the chapel, we see it as an episode in a story with earlier chapters and further ones to follow but whose hope for conclusion, the wild wish that Wollstonecraft expressed in 1792 for a world free from sex-based inequality and oppression, were still working, awaiting and working for well over two centuries later. Thank you. Sorry, let me just unmute. That was amazing, Barbara. Thank you very much. What an enthralling talk. Um, and I think, you know, the way that you delivered and contextualized Mary Wollstonecraft's own words, I, there just couldn't be a better birthday tribute. Um, before I get going and inviting, accepting questions, um, as I said, please do indicate um, in the chat, uh, section if you'd like to ask a question and I'll call on you. Um, 
in in due course. And uh, but I just wanted to ask you something that um, it, it arose from the conversation Roberta and I had when we were doing the tour of, of Newington Green. She mentioned that you'd come several times to Newington Green. Um, you've been in touch with her, and you brought students um, to come and visit the chapel. And I just I just wondered um, what what did the students get? Do you think? Um, about Wollstonecraft from visiting Newington Green in the chapel. Um, and perhaps also the, um, the, the, the once celebrated pub in the area, um, the dissenting academy now sadly replaced by Lady Mildmay um, at, in the corner of Newington Green. Um, there was a huge portrait there, wasn't there, of Mary Wollstonecraft. We wonder what's happened to that. So well, yes, I mean, what were the benefits of visiting this space? What it, what can one learn about about her ideas from just the the place itself? Do you think? Well, I think I think um, as Roberta indicated, I mean, it, you know, I mean, it, for 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 students um, going into a place that that someone that you've been studying. Um, you know, was in and to see, and of course, one of the wonderful things about the chapel is, you know, the the the, the, the pews. You can really get a sense. I mean, it, it, it's not exactly, of course, at all, not just even before the renovation, as it was in. Um, one of beans there. Is someone? Um, could you mute yourself, please? If you're. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think I think you know it, it's it's an extraordinary evocative moving experience for 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 students. Uh, I should also tell you, by the way, that I held the book launch for um, Mary Walsh's Feminist Imagination in the chapel, and um, uh, a friend of mine made these incredible banners which hung um, from the ceiling all around the chapel, um, which were based on, um, uh, the, um, a prince of, of, um, 18th century prince of, um, uh, of Wollstonecraft, Godwin, Rousseau, Price, Tom Paine, and they were draped, they were enormous, they were sort of eight feet. Sadly, uh, these, these huge, these banners, these huge, beautiful banners, were stored somewhere in the chapel and then disappeared. And I, oh. I'm looking at the chapel today, I was thinking, such a shame, because they were absolutely gorgeous. And I have photographs of, of all, of, um, which I'll, I'll try and get reproduced and hand over so you can, people can have them, but of these banners hanging in the, um, um, and, and I had, and I had um, a couple of wonderful actors um, uh, who actually um, read the correspondence um, between um, uh, Wollstonecraft and, and William Godwin, which is a um, pretty sexy, actually, and that was nice, sort of love letters. Oh, it sounds like a magnificent occasion. It was, it was I mean, a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, what better place to launch this new perspective on Mary Wollstonecraft, this one which sort of places religious ideas much more centrally in um in in her in the understanding of her intellectual development and her idea of feminism it's it's yeah it's it's fantastic and it's made a huge difference i think to the discussion on on wollstonecraft subsequently um okay i think we have a a question from lisa vargo first of all lisa can you unmute um hi uh can you see and hear me now i can hear you i don't see you but hello oh. lisa Okay, um, I don't know what happened to the video. Well, anyway, let's, let's just hear the question. Yeah, the question's more important than the video, I hope. And greetings from Saskatoon. It's, it's lovely to see you and thank you for the talk. Um, my question is connected with those words, uh, radical and rational, when they're connected with dissent. Um, and I'm wondering how you, if you differentiate them, uh, or you see them as synonymous. Uh, I would really find that helpful uh, to hear your views uh, about that if my question is clear. So thank you. Um, I think I mean I mean radical dissenters is a is 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 a modern it, it's a recent um, characterization of them. Um, whereas rational dissent was um, a, a much more of a self characterization uh, at the time. Um, I think, um, I mean, the, the term radical dissent is, is useful 
um, for historians because of course there were many um, brands of dissent in um, um, in Britain at this time, um, and not and 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 not all of them um, of the same radical temper um, as um, as the Unitarians. So I think I think that's basically the the distinction. That well, that's enormously helpful. So thank you very much. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thanks, Lisa. Um, now I think we have a question from Laura Kirkley. Can you um, unmute? Hi there. Hi, Barbara. I don't know Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, and this is um, quite a small question, really, but um, I'm interested in. Um, well, first of all, I was really intrigued by that minister from Newcastle as a as a Geordie currently living there. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to know who he was and um, what church he was associated with. But I also wondered. Um, obviously, we know that Wollstonecraft was being really widely read on her death and that her fame was international. But you know, as a linguist, I've focused very much on her European reception. And I just wondered what evidence you'd found of engagement with Wollstonecraft in kind of provincial areas of the UK and in the north in particular. I can't answer that question because I didn't really do very much work of that order. And I think much more has been done yeah. subsequently. Um, and I'm afraid I can't remember that Newcastle. Um, I, mean, I must have it in my notes somewhere, but um, this, um, this lecture is based on research I did a long time ago. <laughs> um, I mean, the, 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 the um, transmission um, of Wollstonecraft's ideas, the translation history, reception history globally, a, a lot of work has been done on that. You would know more about that now than I do. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, I, and there is evidence. I mean, I do have um, in, um, in my book, um, uh, in fact, I think even in my first book, even New Jerusalem, um, uh, evidence of, 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 of uh, radicals, um, overnights and charters, um, traveling around the country and getting people talking, saying things to them about Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, I, I mean, she. Yes, I remember that actually. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I mean, she was yeah. really. She was very much synonymous with. Um, you know, I mean, the the you know the she was it when you met when you use the phrase women's rights, that's yeah. what um, you know. It was Wollstonecraft for, that was who came to mind for a long. A long time. I mean, she was synonymous with uh, with women's rights or the rights of women. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I just it just struck me that we have actually done lots of work on reception, but we're perhaps focusing on the global at the expense of the regional and local at the moment, and and thinking a lot less about. Um, well, I, I, it strikes me that you know I live in Newcastle and I didn't know that, and I <laughs> I just didn't I just didn't know about that particular. I must have read it in your book at some point, but for some reason it I guess you. Were, I mean, you know, I mean, someone must have come across this, and so, I mean, I, I I stumbled across it somewhere, but um, I mean, you'll know better than I will. I mean, the, the, there will be ways. I mean, the, the, the I mean, of course, it's correspondence that suddenly yields treasures like this. Um, but local newspapers, I mean, there's all sorts of possible sources for it. So if people haven't done that work in Newcastle, it might be worth having. Um, be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that would be great. Once the libraries are open again. I know. Um, <laughs> Newcastle <laughs> also has that astonishing lit and fill. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. Which is one of, one of the, I've never oh, been in a lit and fill like that. Fantastic. It's amazing and such a lovely atmosphere. Yeah. Lovely yeah. Place. I mean, yeah. for all the amazing discovery work done by, um, scholars like you Barbara and like Janet Todd um, who have is, cre created the foundations for everything subsequently um, there is still a lot to discover isn't oh, there absolutely. about Wollstonecraft oh absolutely um, so I think um, I now have a question from Judith Thompson can you unmute Judith me I think you're still Imagine. there we are okay there we go can you hear me okay yes okay thank you so much wonderful absolutely yeah. wonderful my question um has to do with um uh mary wollstonecraft in relation to um, i work on allocution um and radicalism um and 
I was wondering, particularly with her school um, and being affiliated with Berg, um, who was well known as an elocutionist. And of course, at that time in 1780s, it's a major thing that's happening in education everywhere, certainly for, for boys' schools. And so I wonder if, uh, and you know, Mary Wollstonecraft had her female reader, an anthology a bit like the anthologies they used for, for with selections for, for elocution. Do you think, or does, is there much known about whether she would have um, taught girls to speak um, in, in her school, um, in her teaching? And um, does, I'm trying to think of places where, you know, does she speak about speaking? Because I know women were um, actively involved, um, not just as audiences, primarily as audiences in lots and lots of discussions about women's uh, rights and, or at least women's issues at debating societies, but there were women um, who, who spoke at those debating societies. Um, anyway, I, at that, right in the, in the 1780s. So I just wondered um, if there's any thoughts on, on, on Wollstonecraft in relation to female elocution and delivery and speech. That's an incredibly interesting question. And, um, and I would, you know, it's one that I would have to go away and really think about. It's one of those questions that kind of then sends you back to the sources um, to, um, you know, with a different, um, there, I mean, I would be astonished if she didn't have, I mean, I, I, I don't have no idea whether, uh, whether she, I, I don't think we know. I mean, uh, uh, Janet Todd's in the audience and if she knows anything about this, I'd be very glad to hear from her. I mean, um, about um, uh, elocution in, um, in the school. And I'm just trying to think about um, the um, Mrs. Mason and, and the little girls, whether, um, Janet, Janet, if you if you if you can help me out with this, I'd be glad to hear from you. But I mean, it's um. So I'm not going to be able to get very far on this, except that I do think, um, I mean, if we take it beyond kind of elocution narrowly understood, and think about the whole question of women's forms of um, presentation in, um, in uh, forms of, 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 I mean, conversation, it was such a huge question in this period. Now, by the 18th century, it had begun to, I mean, it still had the, um, its initial meaning, which was kind of sociality in general. Conversation didn't just mean talk. Um, but one of the things that was said about Wollstonecraft, I mean, it was said, in fact, by Coleridge, was that she was an extraordinary conversationalist. He said, unlike her rather boring <laughs> husband. Um, uh, I mean, it, it was quite, it, it's an amusing, um, I mean, I mean, Coleridge had in fact been a huge admirer of Godwin, of course, but, um, but uh, he, he said that he found Wollstonecraft's conversation really engrossing. Godwin had not found it engrossing at all in his first encounter with Wollstonecraft <laughs> where they had rowed about a religion. Yeah. Um, to the exclusion of practically everybody else at the dinner party. Right. But, um, but I mean, I, you know, I just, I think um, women's ability, women, women feeling entitled to, to express opinions and having, um, I mean, Wollstonecraft is scathing so much of the time in A Rights of Woman about female intellect, not about women's capacity, but about the, the, the shoddy use that they made of it. Um, you know, thanks to the way they were treated, the way they were raised, the way they were educated, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that the the ability to um, you know to think synthetically, to bring ideas together, um, and so on, uh, was immensely important to her. And I'm sure that she must have had things to say about the way they were articulated. But I'm I, I'm afraid I can't recall. But it's a terrific question. So if anyone wants to contribute to it, please come oh, in. I think I know someone in the audience who might be able to contribute. Okay. If she's okay, okay with me calling on her. Um, yeah. Mary, are you are you okay um, for saying a little bit about uh, the work ah. you've done on female speaking? 
Yes, I wonder if, if Janet wanted to come in first because she's been... Sure, sure. Janet, <laughs> Jan, please, oh. you go first. Well, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm blue for a start. You are blue, but we can hear you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I, well, no, the, the next speaker is certainly going to know more than I do, and, and you overestimate my knowledge, Barbara, but thank you so much. Um, I, I don't know, but it, it seemed to me that when I was writing biography and so on, that those schools always would have taught girls the elegant extracts and those had some very serious extracts in them they weren't all um sort of poems about flowers not that they must be denigrated but there were some very philosophical bits of extracts as well and um, that's the sort of uh, education that that uh, Jane Austen both laughs about and clearly had herself and I can't imagine that anybody could actually have a school for girls or indeed for boys, who would not be doing that. Yeah. It's like saying that boys would, would, I mean, they would have to learn Latin so that they could converse in it and also speak it. And I would have thought that the girls, using English as their primary mode, would certainly have learnt large amounts off by heart, mm. which was always useful, but also how to use it and how to bring it in. Um, we have enough uh, examples of Mary Wollstonecraft obviously preaching at people. <laughs> so perhaps she didn't have quite the education that she would be um, expected to give to other girls. Mm. Uh, that doesn't answer it, but I want to come that's back. Very, that's very interesting. That's very I interesting. want to come back at some point and ask you about rational descent and, and Unitarianism and so on, but I'll, I'll leave. This okay, is a very well, interesting well, let's, let's come back to you after Mary, uh, maybe after Mary um, comes in now. But yeah, just just very briefly, it's so Wollstonecraft's um, elocutionary anthology, The Female Reader, is such a fascinating text, and there's more work to be done on it for sure. I think the boring logistical answer is that she does that after she finishes at the school, I think. Um, I might be wrong with that, and it's an exercise that John, Joseph Johnson brings to her. But it tells us a lot about what she's interested in in terms of girls' reading. And actually, it connects so interestingly with the subject of, of your lecture, Barbara, because th there's a real emphasis on devotional writings in her anthology. So she brings together the, the context of rational dissent. Um, and there is quite a long tradition of dissenters writing elocutionary books like William Enfield. But interestingly, he doesn't have a section on devotional pieces. And Barbold later produces one as well. She also doesn't have a devotional hmm. writing section. So Wilson Graft is emphasizing that more than some of her contemporaries. That's interesting. Yeah, I will leave it there. Thank you. It's, it deserves <laughs> more attention, the female reader, doesn't it, among uh, Wilson Graft's works? Well, like, yes. Yeah. Can we bring Jan back in with her question? Is that OK? Jan. I'm unmuting. I love this word, don't you? <laughs> so often in my life, I would like to have unmuted, and other times I would like to have muted, and neither of which was available to us until very recently. But um, uh, that was a wonderful talk, Barbara. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it reminded me of so much that I um, hadn't really clarified, I think, in my, in, in my thinking. Uh, but um, this whole bit... What has always amazed me, yes, when I read it, the, the amount of God in, in the rights of woman is, is, is shocking when you first read it. Um, and what, and yes, I going through her books, you can see her moving into a sort of deism, into a, um, a kind of almost a pantheism at times. I mean, she, she moves around very, very, and just the way that you so, so well described. Why did she not actually go against the Church of England in the end? Why did she not come out and say, I am no longer in this? She must have been completely baptised in it. Um, she knew she was dying at a certain point. Um, there's no set, well, well you know, the, the famous stories of Godwin saying, you know, you're uh, sort of not wanting to hear of any kind of pious statement at the end, if, if that is true. But why did she not actually come out and say, no, I'm no longer a member of any church, do you think? I don't know. I, I, I think she probably didn't care very much. I mean, it, I don't, I, I mean, that's not much of an answer, but, um, um, you know, I mean, she attacks on established religion really yeah. don't feature in her in her work um uh, i i can't i mean um there's um 
I mean, or at least having said that, I'm now trying to, no, I think that's right. I mean, um, in as much as they are, you know, in as much as they form part of a, um, uh, you know, of, of an elite um, uh, in, in British society, which is sort of, you know, um, uh, exploiting, oppressing, creaming mm-hmm. off from from um, the rest of the population. Um, but I, I think, you know, she doesn't, um, uh, I, I can't think of any, um, and I'm very happy to be corrected, attacks on organized religion in her writing. I think that wasn't a direction she was particularly interested in going in. There are, there are some nasty jibes against Catholics, which yeah, you know, right. is yeah. kind of what you yeah. might expect, particularly um, in relation to Burke in A Vindication mm-hmm. of the Rights of, of Men, which is a very ad hominem text. Um, but um, I think the, where, where I think she's not quite, kind of deistic pantheistic in the way is I think she does retain a sense of a personal God that is certainly Mm -hmm. um, Godwin's um, representation of her. I mean, yes, I mean, as he says, it was a religion of her own making Mm -hmm. and um, um, Rousseau is a huge influence on it. Um, I think um, Emil is, she's reading Emil at a crucial time in intellectual development. Um, the Vicar of Savoyard, um, you know, I think is, which is, which is this um, incredibly important statement of enlightened um, natural religion and which was why Emil was, was banned and burnt and, uh, and, and one of the books that got Rousseau driven out of, um, into exile. Um, and I think, um, um, and there's a very, very powerful um, sense of, um, there's a kind of, there's a slightly mystical element, I think, um, yeah. particularly in her very late, I mean, in uh, her, her letters from Sweden, from Sweden. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think where she feels that sense of a sort of transcendent connection. Uh, I mean, certainly uh, the natural world provides uh, a powerful setting for that. Um, and again, I mean, that's, um, I mean, that's, that's Rousseauvian, but I think it's also very, something very, very deeply felt by her. Um, and in, yeah. her, in her writings on, on um, poetry and the poetic impulse and so on. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think the, um, I mean, what is very striking about, however, is that it, it, when it came to suicide, I mean, it, clearly there was no, I mean, at, at the point when she decides um, the second time, which is the, which is the, the absolutely serious, well, I mean, I think they probably were both mm-hmm. serious, but, but I mean, she only just got rescued that time. I mean, it was just sheer mm-hmm. chance that she didn't die. Um, I, you know, there was, I mean, she felt, I think she felt deserted by God. I mean, there is a sense of kind of, of a divine yeah. dereliction as well, you know. Well, thank you. Thank you. That, that, yeah, that, that's a very good, good answer. I'm glad she, you- she, she never, she, she didn't, ever, sorry, I'm, 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 I'll just say one more thing, but it, she never seemed to need a community of belief in the way that Mary Hayes did. No, that's right. And, and Hayes was, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, Hayes and, and, uh, and for, uh, for the quintessential rational dissenter, yeah. feminist, Mary Hayes is the is one. Is the one, yeah. 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 And, 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 and she's an extraordinary woman. Mm, I mean, absolutely. she's a, 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 an extraordinary intellectual and, yes, um, and a much better novelist true. than Mary Wollstone. Absolutely <laughs> true. But, but not so glamorous, actually. No, not glamorous, no. no. Anyway, I will mute. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Jan. you so much, Barbara. It was wonderful. Thanks for your question, Jan. It's lovely to have you here. Um, I'm glad you mentioned, Barbara, in that, in that response, um, that... Um, the, the, the sort of 
the nature writing aspect of, um, of, of the Scandinavian letters. Um, today, um, B. Rolat um, of the Wollstonecraft Society and the Mary on the Green campaign, she, wrote, she very wittily cited Woodland Wollstonecraft um, and brought out some wonderful quotes um, to that effect from, from the Scandinavian letters. And um, B actually had a question that she wanted me to put. I think maybe I'll make it the last one because we've got, we've got some informal chat coming up. Um, but perhaps we could end the formal part of the Q&A um, with this question, which is, um, what is the that you would like to have discovered or to be discovered about Mary Wollstonecraft? What do we not know that we you'd most like us to know? Oh dear. I mean, it's the sort of historian's dream, isn't it? I mean, I want to I want to walk onto Newington Green and find her sitting on a bench. <laughs> um, and um, uh, she was, I think we need to remember um, what we what we all probably know, but sometimes don't want to know about Mary Wollstonecraft was that she wasn't an entirely agreeable person. She was um, um, very satirical, quite sarcastic a lot of the time. If she didn't agree with you, she let you know. Um, she was not terribly keen on um, well, I mean, her relationships with women were very difficult. I, when I was working on Wollstonecraft and felt that I had the most intimate of connections with her, um, which is, of course, is the fantasy of the historian, you know, but, um, uh, and um, so I, you know, I used to think of Mary Wollstonecraft as someone who um, would be living um, somewhere um, 50 or 60 miles, I mean, I mean maybe down in, in, in Brighton or over in Cheshire somewhere. So we would see each other maybe every six months or something. And that would be lovely. We'd have a lovely time. Um, but I didn't want her on my doorstep. Um, and I think, I think we're always with thinkers, there's more there's more to be thought about, more. Um, and, and one of the things that I will say a little bit polemically is that has made it difficult to do that has been the wish to categorize her. Um, you know, is she a liberal? Is she a Republican? Is she this? Is she that? And um, I am very resistant to this. I'm very resistant to this attempt to corral her into one or other pre-existing um, category. This has been an attempt to, to push her into the canon of political thought and to find a label to attach to her that would put her in the canon. And, and she's a canon buster. You know, she doesn't fit in. Sexual politics don't fit in into the canon um, and it's time that, 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 you know, that people let go, I think of that and let the, and, and instead let Mary Wollstonecraft shake up our sense of the canon. And so if I guess if I thought mm -hmm. that there was a legacy of Mary Wollstonecraft, it would be to make people think again about what counts as political philosophy, because right now that is a boy's game and it really needs to change. Um, and I know there's a lot of women who have been you know, trying to do that, but it, it's not gonna work if we, if we try and corral women into pre-existing categories. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's a, a wonderfully rousing way, I think, to, to round <laughs> off the talk. Um, absolutely, it's been magical. And I think it's been online speaking at its best, actually. I mean, there's been something so, um, you know, so intimate about being able to enter your study in this way and hear your thoughts, um, your wonderful thoughts on Wollstonecraft. And I mean, certainly, I can't recommend Barbara's work highly enough. If you haven't had the chance to read it yet, go away and read uh, 
Mary Wollstonecraft and the Feminist Imagination and other wonderful articles that she, she's written on Wollstonecraft um, to follow up on this talk. Um, I don't know if you'd like to stay on, Barbara. We're just, sure. I've, I've invited everyone who it might be interested in um, joining the Mary Wollstonecraft Fellowship um, to stay on. And there's also an opportunity to ask Roberta about um, some of her remarks that she's waving um, during the film um, section of this evening's proceedings. Um, so you'd be very welcome to come along for either of those reasons or indeed just to hang out and say hi. Um, so please do stay on if you can, but I'll understand if you need to go off and have some supper or whatever. <laughs> so no offense taken, but thank you so much for coming this evening and celebrating Mary Wollstonecraft's birthday with us. It's been great. So, got a few people seem to be staying on. Um, so, um, Thank you, as I said, for, for staying on to hear a bit more about the Mary Wollstonecraft Fellowship. Um, so as I said at the beginning, um, before the film, not perhaps not all of you were there then, um, it's a new literary society um, dedicated to appreciation of the writings of Wollstonecraft and study of her life and times and circle. So and we were we were launched in um, in 2019 at the first celebration that we had, first birthday celebration. And um, I'm delighted to say that um, Jan Todd, who's come and joined us this evening, has very graciously said that she would um, she would take part in this this new organisation as its patron. Um, she's done so much to lay the foundations, as I said, of all subsequent Wollstonecraft scholarship with her editions, her biography. Um, her bibliography. I mean, back in the 1970s, she was um, doing a complete audit of all the work that had previously been published on Wollstonecraft. So she is a very foundational figure. And um, I'm, I'm really pleased to say that um, we've also been discussing the possibility of a talk as part of the Mary Wollstonecraft uh, Fellowship um, activities, where she'll tell us a little bit more about um, her experience and discovering and, and recovering uh, Mary Wollstonecraft um, in the 1970s uh, at a time when um, she told us at the first celebration, um, she was um, she was told that no, she couldn't take Mary Wollstonecraft as the topic for her PhD thesis. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm hoping will happen before too long, perhaps in the autumn. Um, we still got to get, iron out the details of that and it might be a hybrid event. Um, does anyone have any any thoughts or questions? I've been talking, I can see Miriam El Jamil there. We've been talking a little bit about um, ways of setting up this, this very new entity, the Mary Wollstonecraft Fellowship. Um, and it's been somewhat stymied by COVID, I've got to say. I mean, like so many things, it's been very difficult to keep things going. We were hoping to have a physical meeting last April. That didn't happen. Um, so um, I'm very interested in people who might like to come on board and particularly in this first phase um, might be interested in the communication side. So people with an interest perhaps in website design, we've got a, a kind of holding operation as far as that's concerned. And um, also um, perhaps putting together a biannual newsletter for the fellowship, drawing together events and information, not just from the fellowship, but also from sister organizations like the Wollstonecraft Society, this new educational trust that B. Rowlett has, has set up and um, the Mary Wollstonecraft Philosophical Society, an academic organization um, focusing on political science in the United States, um, but with an international membership. So, um, so that's one area that I'd be, I'd love to hear from people who might like to, to get active in the organization. Any, any thoughts, questions? 
at this stage. Communications generally would be very helpful. Well, mull it over and get in touch with me. Um, you'll know how to find me, I'm sure. Um, I'm actually now in the English department at Uppsala University, but you can also contact us through the Mary Wollstonecraft uh, website, Mary Wollstonecraft Fellowship website. Um, do I have any questions at all for Roberta? Or Roberta, would you like to follow up on um, Barbara's talk? I think you, you raised a question which we didn't quite get to um, about the provincial reach of, uh, of Mary Wollstonecraft or her connections with the provinces. Yes, well, uh, I am open for questions from others, but uh, I, I first I'd like to say thank you to Barbara. But it's a great delight to welcome you virtually to the refurbished chapel, as it were, um, if only it could be in person. Um, and I take your point about the, um, the value to your students of coming to the place of Wollstonecraft's um, intellectual birth, if you like. Um, because it reminds me very much of, of two years ago, uh, Emma, when we had that marvelous day at which many of you were present at the other, um, the other church, Old St. Pancras Church. And I was um, struck then by, uh, I'm steeped in the atmosphere, as, as you can all know, but to have um, academics there who spend an awful lot of their time in, in windowless lecture rooms, um, to be uh, so appreciative of, of the atmosphere of that place and singing happy birthday and blowing out the candles um, was, was just a wonderful um, event. And we have other wonderful ways of doing it virtually, but it's, it's never going to be the same. Um, so my, uh, I, was in, I was in Newington Green earlier today, actually, on the green, looking at the, the sculpture and, and looking at um, people celebrating Mary Wollstonecraft's birthday in their own way with, with little artistic uh, input. However, I have a, a, se a separate question which I pose to, to Barbara um, and to everybody here uh, with the, your collective uh, reach. Um, I also had not heard of this, uh, this chap in Newcastle, Laura. I mean, I don't know anything about Newcastle, uh, except I could find it on a map. But, um, but there's a wonderful woman from Liverpool. Her name's Hannah Gregg. And here's the biography, A Lady of Cotton. She was from a Liverpool Unitarian family. Her father died and her mother invested in the education of her daughters. And they sent her to Newington Green where she had cousins and she stayed with, um, with the Rogers family. And she boarded at the school in Stoke Newington, uh, but then came down every Saturday to spend the weekend with her cousins and, and uh, attend the chapel. She was 17 when she arrived just at the same time as Mary Wollstonecraft was living there. So there's no positive proof that I know of that they knew each other, but it seems impossible to me that this um, lively, intelligent 17 year old would not be very aware of um, the charismatic young school teacher across the green, across the pews. And the reason why we know about um, Hannah Lightbody, she went on to be Hannah Gregg, um, as mistress of Quarry Bank Mill, the subtitle of her biography, um, which was um, the crux of the Industrial Revolution. And so whatever it was that she absorbed in her education in Newington Green, including the, the, the circle around Wollstonecraft, it fed into her um, uh, care of the young apprentices. Um, her husband ran the, the cotton mill and she ran the apprentices homes, education, medicine um, and spiritual care and so on. So does anybody know, can anybody find a treasure trove of letters yet uncovered um, to find a proof of the connection between Hannah Lightbody Gregg and Mary Wollstonecraft? That's my, my question. I think it's worth re remembering that the charismatic Wollstonecraft was a little post this period. I mean, you know, we're, we've got a young woman who um, at this particular moment is still very much kind of struggling to earn a living and taking things in, absorbing ideas. Um, we're still a little way off from, you know, the Mary Wollstonecraft who um, 
begins to acquire uh, a, a literary profile, which, you know, originally, as I've said, is a, a kind of pretty standard sort of hack writer profile. And then, and then of course, you know, and then comes the French Revolution and everything, as Godwin says, you know, everything changed for Mary Wollstonecraft. So, um, I mean, she may, uh, uh, which doesn't mean that an encounter between these, um, you know, the, the young Wollstonecraft and the young woman that it, it, this biography is about would not certainly have been very interesting to find out about, but the, um, um, but the, um, you know, the moment in which, you know, one might be sort of dazzled by <laughs> Mary Wollstonecraft is still a little way, a little way to, to, um, to come. But, um, but obviously, I mean, you know, there will be correspondence that will show up. I mean, is it, you know, there will be more letters. I mean, um, not necessarily up, up um, by Wollstonecraft, but there will be letters which will mention Wollstonecraft that, you know, will, will yet show up. And um, as, you know, there are, there, there are archives that are full of um, letters and there's, and there's people's attics um, you know, families that have um, correspondence and so on that has never been archived. And things do just, um, in my first book, um, uh, I, I, someone um, came to me who had found a letter just when you used to be able to buy them in secondhand bookshops would have you know, old letters that you could buy. And he found a letter um, from a woman called Anna Wheeler, who was uh, one of the leading early socialist feminists, and there it was sitting there. He paid fifty p for it. So, <laughs> so yeah, there's excitements to come still. Oh, absolutely! I mean, it was just two years ago that um, the a work um, a, a work on botany in the in in Cuba is not correct was was rediscovered. Um, it had been lost. This was by the sister-in-law of uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, the wife of her younger brother, Charles. Um, it had been um, lost because of a misspelling of the name Wollstonecraft. <laughs> and <laughs> I should think that's actually remarkably common. We need to check all spellings um, to, to see if we can recover some, some more material that way. And in fact, um, uh, in the wake of that rediscovery, um, Alan Coffey, I know, is about to bring out an article on um, Nancy Wollstonecraft, this uh, this sister-in-law that Wollstonecraft herself, of course, never met. Um, he married uh, Charles Wollstonecraft, married her in in, in America, um, but nevertheless, she took a keen interest in Wollstonecraft's works and was was a feminist advocate. Hmm. Very interesting. Mm. I something. Can I? I don't know if I'm muted or not, but just nope. for Roberta, um, when you mentioned Hannah Gregg and, and correspondence, and this also connects back to Newcastle, the earlier discussion, um, in, in my research on Fellwall, I, I basically went to all these provincial towns where he had connections um, um, among Unitarians and radical dissenters. Um, and found, I know that in Manchester, I remember being entranced by reading, and I can't remember whether it was Hannah Gregg, she was part of that circle, but um, uh, extensive correspondence of which I only just, you know, nibbled to see if I could find anything on Fellwall, but um, uh, by either Hannah Gregg or somebody else in that circle, um, which was, uh, I think it was at the Rylands Library in Manchester. Um, and likewise in Newcastle, um, I just had this amazing sense that all of those provincial towns were so incredibly, had such rich, rich, um, radical um, uh, circles who were connected, they're all connected to one another and they're connected to people. And, and uh, the other one that was really interesting from a, a, a feminist point of view was, was Norwich um, with the uh, plum trees and, and a wonderful little girl, um, Gurney, um, who's, you know, extensive diaries. And she's like, what, 12 years um, 
just uh, a terrific voice. So I also feel like uh, there's there's so much that will be out there to, to find and to enrich the way in which, you know, the intellectual conversations that are happening um, throughout the entire country, as well as transatlantically, obviously, but. Thanks, Judith. Yes, it's only 10 years ago that we found out the father of Claire Claremont by um, a, a, an Australian genealogist who's never been to Britain, uh, looking for her own family tree and stumbling across uh, Mary Jane, uh, the second wife of Godwin, and, and finding out about, about her, her children's father. So it'll, it will all come out. More and more things will come out including letters that are not literary letters, but lawyers' letters about settlement of, of child support payments. I think I'm going to have to, oh, I see someone wants to ask about Fanny. About Fanny, but I think, I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to go now. I see it's almost 7.30. It is and, indeed, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, thank you very much for having me. It, oh, Barbara, no, thank you. Wonderful, I mean, it's, wonderful it's, occasion. It's been and, tremendous. Um, um, so. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye then. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. So, um, as I said, please do let me know if you're interested in keep, keeping in touch. Um, you can actually sign up to the mailing list of the Mary Wollstonecraft Fellowship online. Um, and, uh, oh, actually put an offer here, Virginia, thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, so yes, I'll be, in, I'll be in touch with anyone who's, um, who indicates uh, that they'd like to keep in touch and, um, and we'll keep on announcing um, further events during the year. Um, there's been suggestions that we could maybe organize some outings. Roberta, um, you would be our, our expert in that respect. And, um, and, and I'd also be quite interested in talking with members about um, a potential fundraising effort. When we had our first celebration at St Pancras Old Church, we couldn't help noticing that um, the monument to Wollstonecraft and Godwin in the churchyard needed a little, little bit of TLC. So I thought that might be something that we could kind of come together on and, um, and maybe organize some kind of event around to, to raise funds for uh, a refurbishment. So apparently last done in the early 90s. Anyway, just a few thoughts. Um, it's been fantastic to, to have you here. Thank you very, very much, all of you, for attending and creating this sense of spirit and togetherness um, virtually. And uh, um, hope to see you again in real life. <laughs> Bye now. Thank you.